Hello. Um, thank you for coming. Um, my name's Kale. Uh, I am a senior SRE at a company called Octopus Deploy, um, where I work in a team that makes sure that our internal tooling, the way we build and test and deliver our products, uh, is available and healthy for the rest of the company to use. Um, I hope that you're all excited here to hear all about how things can go horribly wrong at scale. Um, in particular, how you can break Kubernetes in weird and wonderful ways. Um, we're also going to spend some time talking about what we learned from breaking Kubernetes in weird and wonderful ways. First, though, we have to answer the question, what is Octopus Deploy? Um, I'm not here to sell you on the product, but we have to understand what it does for this story to make any sense. Um, its purpose is to orchestrate continuous deployment pipelines for our customers. Um, and to test that functionality, we have to provide remote deployment targets during test, you know, otherwise the product doesn't work. Broadly speaking, there are two ways we do remote deployments. One is using an agent that we install on a remote machine, and the other is using SSH directly from the orchestrating server out to the deployment target, which is the topic of our talk today. First, though, we need to talk about how not to do SSH testing. Many, many years ago, um, we used to have what I'm going to call medium-lived VMs that lived in the cloud. They ran SSHD. They had a well-known key pair. They were open to the internet. Now, every security professional in the room, I think just, I saw some little steam just come out of your ears just then. I, I promise this is not how we do it anymore. We killed it with fire. We set up a project to figure out what to replace that with. And we landed on um, having the test runner uh, deploy pods into a dedicated namespace in a cluster. Those pods would have a per test key pair. They wouldn't be accessible to the internet. They would be torn down after they're done. A little bit more secure, I think you might agree. Um, that's, an ex that's an example of what that might look like. Um, before I go much further, um, who here is like a Kubernetes novice? Like you maybe you're sort of learning about it, but, uh, but um, all right. Uh, anybody running Kubernetes in production? You've seen it fail horribly. Great. Shh. You can see the mistake, I think. Don't tell anyone. Let's get the story out of the way first. OK. On the 25th of August, 2022, at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we started getting some alerts into our infrastructure alerting channel. And they look like this. Um, an image pull back off is when you have a pod that's launching. It's trying to get its image from a registry. It can't for some reason. And it's saying, hey, I just need to wait for a while. This is just too hard. So we start an incident. There's quite a few of these going off. We go in and look at the cluster, and then we see this. Now, I'd never seen this before. This baffling. And what this is basically saying is that Kubelet, which is the distributed worker that runs on each node, can't talk to Container D, which is the Container Manager service, on the same node. That shouldn't be possible. We do some more digging, and we realize these nodes are horribly overloaded. Um, oh, yeah, you can kind of see that. Um, this graph is showing the number of waiting containers across the namespace. And that peak up at the top there is 750. Now, I don't know what scale you run at. Maybe that's not very much. For us, that's a lot. That horizontal line at the bottom there is the normal amount of waiting containers, about five. So this is over 100 amount, uh, times the amount of, of yet to be scheduled work. This is not a good situation for us to be in. In addition, we realize that it's not just one bad node. There's some retry pattern here that is causing the system to give up on that node and go launch hundreds of pods on another node, and another node, and another node. Oh, dear. So we try to get ahead of the problem. We go in and we uh, manually scale up the node pool very quickly to try and give it some breathing space. We also ship an infrastructure change to drop the, number, the maximum number of pods per node from 250 to 125. Now, again, the experts in the room, why was it ever 250? I promise there's a good reason. I'll come back to it later. We also ship a change on the test runner to increase the um, timeout before it waits to retry, just in case that's contributing to the issue. Some hours go by while these changes roll out, and thankfully, we see the number of waiting pods come down. Things kind of come back to a normal situation. We call the incident done. About a week later, we want a retro, as we do, and we look for what we call contributing factors to this incident. 
we see, okay, um, turns out these nodes are actually quite a bit smaller than any of us really remembered. Um, they're also running normal disks, so not SSDs, spinning metal. Uh, that's foreign to some people these days, but we were running, you know. Um, we we're also saying image pool policy of always. What this means is that every single pod landing on that node is going to go make a call out to the registry just to check if the, note, if the image hash has changed. And you combine all of that with 200 pods arriving at the same time, as we saw, you're going to have a bad time. As I mentioned, we also had a retry pattern causing cascading failure through the cluster, not just a single point of failure. And the only other thing we could really figure out is that maybe we had slightly more builds than usual. But not 100 times more, a little bit more. Now, as we all know, you have your incident, you do your retro, you take some corrective actions, and then you fix things, and that means you won't have the same problem again. I mean, it's not like I'd come up here in front of all of you and talk about how we not only had one, but two incidents where we couldn't launch these pods. I mean, that would just be... Um, <clears throat> On the 29th of November 2023, 15 months later, we get an alert that says, it's a bit different this time, it says the tests are failing because pods aren't launching. Now, this seems familiar. We start an incident, we go in and have a look, we see a different error message. This one might be more familiar to you. This is saying that the node is approaching overload and it's trying to kick out or evict work based on a kind of complicated ranking mechanism. This is what you would normally see well before that first one. And we noticed, hmm. Oh. For the novices in the room, um, the deployment manifest can optionally have a thing called a resource request at the bottom here, where you tell the cluster, my workload needs a little bit of RAM, it needs a little bit of CPU, and then the uh, scheduler makes sure that it only puts the work on a node that has that much capacity left. We hadn't done that. So we shipped a change to do that. That took a while to roll out, things calmed down, we call the incident done. In the retro, we kind of struggled because we'd made the pod limit change and we had actually, um, in the intervening months, moved to SSDs, maybe that helped. But we hadn't made any other changes. I mean, maybe the only new contributing factors was that we hadn't done anything. You might be thinking, well, didn't you learn anything the first time around? We had made changes, but for operational reasons, the first incident we really struggled to actually make those infrastructure changes quickly. So we made improvements to pipeline safety. They helped us respond more quickly, but they didn't prevent the second occurrence. It turns out our system was complex enough that it made it impossible for us to know at what point it was going to fail. You know, we had an over-provisioning system that was supposed to see us approaching limits and expand nodes, didn't work. We had a janitor that was supposed to go and spot pods that had been hanging around for too long and remove them. But we still hit issues when, turns out, test runs just flat out stop removing their pods. These horizontal lines here are entire test runs worth of pods just hanging around. The systems we had couldn't keep up. Now, I said just before we had a complex system. If you're not familiar with that term, it's got many definitions out there. Here's one I like. Complexity starts when causality breaks down. And you notice that's a physicist. This is not just a technology thing. Complex systems exist in many places in many domains. For today, the idea that direct causal connection between one part of a system and the behavior of the rest of the system may not be real is the idea I want to put into your heads. The first incident involved maybe slightly higher than historic levels of builds. The second incident involved maybe um, tests not cleaning up after themselves as much as they used to. Now, you might be tempted to call those the root causes of those incidents. And if so, I, I need to digress just a little bit. There's a, a piece of children's literature uh, called Who Sank the Boat? It's written by Pamela Allen. I read it to my kids. They love it. The story is quite simple. There are four big farm animals, and they all get into a boat one by one. Um, and there's a mouse. And at the end of the story, the mouse gets into the boat, and the boat sinks. And it ends with the line, you do know who sank the boat. Do we, though? 
Did the mouse cause the incident? Was it all the animals together? What about the fact that the boat was unattended? Where were the lifeguards? Which change approval board said that they could get in the boat? You get my point, right? Pinning things on what I would call the trigger, the first domino to fall, if you like, is a bit too simplistic, in my opinion. It limits how you see your world, how you see your systems, and it limits the kinds of things you can learn from their failures. Who's heard of Occam's Razor? What, what, the simplest explanation is usually the best, right? Does anybody know why it's called that? Well, I did some reading. Um, it, it was attributed to William of Ockham, spelt slightly differently, and it, it turns out he never actually used these words. It also turns out he didn't invent it. It maybe was Aristotle thousands of years ago, although he didn't write that in English, of course. And, and it turns out that the exact words that William of Ockham supposedly said, he also hasn't written down anywhere. So it was maybe John Punch said it instead. My point is, you can't apply Occam's razor to Occam's razor, right? Show some limitations of the, of, a, of the approach. In medicine, they use Occam's razor for diagnoses, but they also have a thing called Hickam's dictum that says broadly, a patient can have as many diagnoses as they damn well please. And I'd like to very humbly propose Young's corollary, that's, that's my surname, to Occam's razor, which is that the simplest explanation probably isn't the only one. Some of the factors that our team's uncovered over time need deeper, deeper exploration than I really have time for, unfortunately. But I'm going to introduce some concepts and some terms that maybe you can go do some reading afterwards if you'd like. One of the primary challenges we face is, is providing a reliable system against slowly growing demand, against inexorably growing demand. Not spikes, just like slowly going up. Sidney Decker, who is a safety academic, writes in his book Drift Into Failure about drift into failure. And this is where things seem to fail quickly, but when you look back, it actually turns out there was this slow erosion of safety margin over time through normal activities, and this is something you need to be aware of. Um, Robert Hoffman and David Woods write about the law of stretched systems, which says that in any complex system, any improvements you might make are rapidly eaten up by other stakeholders in the system. You might have heard this expressed as work expands to fill the space provided, or similar things, but there's actually a studyable effect that these two have, have documented. And finally, Richard Cook in How Complex Systems Fail writes about an, the idea of latent failure mode, which is where your systems have these, these points of failure that you're not aware of until you're well beyond them. We only know the cause of an incident after it's happened. That might seem like an obvious thing to say, but I want to dig into hindsight just a little bit. Our team made a bunch of reasonable decisions the whole, all along the way, this whole journey. For example, 250 pots. We actually tested that in the beginning. It worked totally fine, really robust. It was not a problem for us until it became a problem for us. Near as we can tell, the workloads went from using 5 megs of memory to 50 megs of memory, and that doesn't seem like much until you have hundreds of them, hundreds of them on, a pot, on a node with 4 gigs of RAM, and then that's a problem. What seemed reasonable in the beginning was eventually not reasonable. But that doesn't make the original decision wrong. You might find yourself looking back during or after an incident and judging your decisions or others' decisions. In those moments, try to be blameless. Um, Matt Davis writes a great blog about this. He calls it the Tao of blamelessness. He says that blame is a normal human feeling. You're going to feel it. But try to set it to one side when you're thinking about what you should learn from some, some situation. So what did we learn? And other than ignoring this ad that's been following me on Reddit for the last few months, <laughs> I'd say we had a 15-month period where the mitigating actions we took the first time around worked just fine. So was the second incident a repeat? Is a repeat even possible? I don't want to be too philosophical here, but I think it's a valid question to ask. Try to be honest with yourself. If you're proposing a change so that this doesn't happen again, what do you mean by that? Can you even guarantee that? Given what we talked about earlier about causality leaving the room in complex systems, I don't think you can. So I'd say that we learned that we can't completely prevent similar failure modes just by taking specific corrective actions. We have to prepare for failure regardless. 
But if you want to take away one thing, it's that even the smallest deployment should probably have a resource request. Um, I'm a hobbyist photographer. And there's a thing in photography called the rule of thirds. You know, you want to put someone's face on a nice third line, horizontal or vertical in a picture. But there are great photos that don't follow that rule. Use it as a sensible default until you know enough about your system and about Kubernetes to know when not to use it, even though it's optional. If you want to take away two things, it's that the systems you work on and are part of are capital C complex. Um, I've used a, a term there, socio-technical. Um, the software that you use or, and or are affected by requires technology and people inextricably linked to work. Um, I think we're better served trying to improve our world in general rather than focusing on what caused our last incident. And we've talked about contributing factors for failure, but also think about your contributing factors for success and invest in those. And finally, um, I've talked about a lot of failure here, but what about doing Kubernetes well? Well, right after this, uh, my colleague Rob Pearson is giving a talk about how we did a migration. Hopefully there's a lot less fail in it than that one. Stick around. Um, other than that, I need to thank my past and present colleagues, and those who reviewed the talk, my wonderful partner. And if this is the kind of thing that interested you, um, I'm going to give you some optional homework, which is to go to how.complexsystems.fail. It's a very short read. It's not a dry academic text. Um, and if it unlocks something in your brain, reach out to me on LinkedIn. It's unfortunately my only public social media. Um, I'd love to hear from you. So thank you very much. I think I have some time for questions.